How many four-letter words can I use on that? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to switch to a double. Jetta is driving. Nothing yet. Breakdown. Michael Jetta. Oh, Nick, I'm a top guy, so I love top wrestling. Hale tries to sing him. He does. Maximus Hale the fall. So I think I think that wrestling wrestling is 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 the greatest sport on on, on, on earth. Another edition of On3 Wrestling here on On3 Sports. I'm your host, Nick Costco, and with me today is Steve Garland, head coach of the University of Virginia. Coach, a pleasure to talk to you. Season just right around the corner, just a few days away now at this point, so I can only imagine that preseason work is uh, finally coming to fruition. You're like, all right, it's time to wrestle somebody else at this point. Yeah, yeah, we actually, it's funny you say that. We we did two uh, wrestle-off weekends, so we did two weeks ago, we did like a prelims, um and then this past week we did our f- sort of finals and so yeah i mean t- twofold one it's it's i think we did a good job of preparing them for for this weekend because you know they they had to make weight and they had to compete in a real with real referee with real official you know people in the stands and so we feel like that's going to give them the best possible um you know preparation for the weekend but then secondly yeah i mean the other thing is i think we're over wrestling each other at this point we want to see some, some somebody else and I think the biggest thing is as a coach, this is just strictly coaches X and O's are like, we're so relieved that we're seeing them execute things we've been working on since not just August when we started preseason, but also way back in the, you know, think about April, May, June, July, when we were doing all our RTC stuff, these, these different tack areas that we had, we see them doing those things well. And so that that's exciting for us to see that. I can only imagine November 1st, you guys open up against North Dakota State, so that should be a really good duel. So I want to talk about some of that lead up throughout the preseason. You just mentioned all the RTC stuff going back from April, May, and all the way up through July. Now you got your actual preseason in August and uh, September. What was the whole summer for you guys like leading up to this coming season? I know you, 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 know, you brought some guys back, brought in a good recruiting class as well. So just on the surface, what was the summer train like leading into that preseason? Yeah, so so I got Trent and Travis Paulson here and Ian Parker. Mm-hmm. And the Paulsons, you know, they were both world team members. Trent was a national champion. Uh, Travis was Olympic alternate. I mean, they 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 believe in summer training, right? And obviously we always have two, but they're really helpful with getting a system in place where we, as soon as the season was over, we gave them a week off, came back, and we started RTC training with, with, with two sort of focuses. The first block was training for Vegas. Then we gave them a little time off after that. Then the next block was training for U23s in Ohio. And we did that block, and then we – for the first time in a long, very long time, I gave him two, two to three weeks off just to be, uh, you know, I've, I've never done that before. And I mm-hmm. felt like we just had to let them get with their families, be a kid, you know, have a milkshake. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm a, such a grind. I've been doing this for so long and grinding for so long. I don't really know what it would be like to do that, but I felt like they needed it. And then we brought everybody back early August and we just went, we've been going straight through since then. So those were kind of the three, the three blocks in the segments, how they worked out. I find it fascinating that you know you've been doing this for so long, and then you know not 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 to say you've never adjusted your plan or your your rotation or however you do it. I can't believe we've never done that before. Wait, 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 what was that like? You know, just not even having that you know, having that that type of grind and that type of training for you know, as you said, maybe like a two week block where it's like, hey, there's nothing going on right now. I have to worry about what's going on later now. You know, well, it's so funny. So for me, it was it was awesome in that honestly, my break from them was just as important as their break from me. I mean, I'm all over them about everything. Everybody knows me, knows I'm a follow through guy, I'm a detail guy. I mean, communication, follow through, responsiveness. I beat them in these guys' heads, and and I'm a grinder, and I don't take days off, and so I'm, I can be a bit much to be around. So I think they needed a break for me, but then also they're pretty needy kids too. So and I'm always helping them bending over backwards for something for them. So it was good for me to get away from them. So that break was actually healthy. But I would say this in that break. I, I didn't get to just put my, you know, those sort of lay back on a beach. I ended up, that's when I did all, a lot of my fundraising. That's when I was kicking up, traveling across the country, flying across the country, driving across the country and meeting with different donors with different funds and in, 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 in the landscape of current, the current landscape of collegiate athletics, you have to be constantly fundraising mine. So that's when I did the bulk of that travel during that stretch when they were gone. And then when they came back, I tried to time it. So I was back in action in the room when they came back. We'll get into like the new wave of a college athletics in a little bit. I wanted to stick with the guys right now on the roster. You guys you got two NCAA qualifiers coming back. Marlon Yarbrough at 133 and Nick Hamilton at 165. I got to imagine based on projections, they're going to stay at those weights for this coming yeah. year. If they're not, I don't know where they're going to go. But when you look at the – I guess they're, they're, they are your de facto leaders in that wrestling room right now based on their experience and then they know what it takes to win at this program. Uh, what can you say about those guys' development yeah. from last year into uh, this coming season? 
Yeah. So yeah. So Marlon last year beat four guys ranked in the top 15, two guys ranked in the top 10 and beat two all three turning all Americans. So he had some huge wins for us last year. And he's definitely a, you know, a ranked top should be top 10 ranked guy. He's a very talented guy. Um, and then, and then Nick Hamilton is just like, it's funny. We had rock Harrison in yesterday doing stuff mm-hmm. for ESPN. And I, I was, he's like, who's your guy? And I go, that's the guy that we want everybody to be like. I mean, no excuses, works his tail off, doesn't have the most athleticism, doesn't have all the flashiest wrestling moves, but how he won ACCs last year and got OW was just straight grinding. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he beat a, a stud from NC state just by Matt returning him like 10 times in 30 seconds. I mean, it just, it just takes heart and courage. I mean, it's just, it's not easy. Uh, he's got a 3.7. He's in the McIntyre school of business, which here at UVA is one of the top, it's one of the top business schools in the world. And here at UVA, it's one of the most prestigious majors you can be in. Mm-hmm. So he's doing everything the hard way, you know? And, and so that's a guy we point to from our guys. But another guy actually missed was a national qualifier a couple of years ago was Dylan Sedeno. Yes. A Jersey yeah. guy. So he, uh, he, he'll be back as well. And he's a leader as well in the room vocally. And he's just been through it. He's a fifth year He's a veteran. Uh, he eats right. He trains right. He's kind. Of, he's got a really good lifestyle for the guys to emulate. So those three guys are, yeah. I, th- I think we got a good group of guys for them to look to in the room. I'm interested in Nick Hamilton because you just mentioned how you know not the most athletic, not the most physically gifted guy, but he just wants it. He works, and obviously, you know, going through ACCs last year and you know, knocking off some guys. He's only a sophomore though, which is interesting. Well, and again, he's it's his third year in the program. When a guy like that who has one year in the varsity lineup and all of a sudden. He goes into this run last year, and now there's expectations around him. What does that do for him mentally, and how do you guys maybe – I don't know if you treat him differently or coach him differently. Or how do you manage that with a guy like that? Man, that's a great question. I think you have to be careful with the expectations for mm-hmm. sure because the reason why he did what he did is because – I mean, these are his words, not mine. We had a heart-to-heart with with all our leaders in the summer, and we're like, man, what, what Nick did at the end of the year was just amazing, and he just basically was like – Coach, I had mono, I had concussions, I had a torn this, a torn that. He goes, because I was so up against it, I had it was just straight up, I'm just going to do everything I can. I'm just going to go crazy because I got – this season's been a train wreck, so what, what what do I got to lose type thing? And so one of the reasons why I think he, he wrestled so well is because he was just – his back was against the wall, and he's like, he chose to make a hard decision and respond to adversity. Uh, so I think what he has to do and what we're trying to talk to him about, we'll probably need to talk to more about it after you just brought that up, is – is approach it the exact same way. Nothing's changed. Nothing changes in your approach is you're still the underdog. You're still the guy. No one expects, um, you know, you got to wrestle like it's like you did last year, even though you're nationally ranked or even though people think you should win because you beat so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, I think that'll be critical for him moving forward. It's a, that nothing should change in terms of his approach. When two and two at NCAAs last year could certainly make another big jump here in 24, 25. As far as the new guys that are into your program, you guys had the 25th ranked recruiting class nationwide uh, by flow wrestling. Who's really stood out from that freshman class so far. Do you expect any instant contributions from those guys and how have they adapted from going from the high school room? into you know yeah. summer preparation into the Virginia wrestling room. Yeah, so the two guys, uh, Max Shulaw just won a huge match against Stephen Burrell. Stephen Burrell, for those who don't know, was a national prep champion in OW. He also took third at the U.S. Open, mm-hmm. age group open this summer in Vegas. He took second at the World Team Trials as a high school senior. So he's really good. And Max is such a gamer. I mean, Max found a way to beat him in a crazy match. I think it was like eight, seven, something insane. Mm-hmm. Like that it was like back and forth and just an awesome battle. So he's really, I mean, that's, I mean, he was a huge recruit coming out of high school too. So we, we had expectations for him, but you know, look, you hit the nail on the head. I think that first month in the room was rough for him though. I think he would admit that if he's being honest, it was tough, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he, but he's a gamer. And so he stayed the course and he, and he performed when he, when he had to perform. So um, he's one guy. The other guys are heavyweight. Brennan Morgan. He went undefeated. He's state champ from Pennsylvania. Brennan was a high school national champ as well. He went viral for he hit a magic stick at the Dapper Dan, uh, <laughs> which was Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic, which was pretty amazing for a guy his size. And he's really good. He gave our heavyweight, our, our senior heavyweight, our grad school heavyweight, who's one of our leaders as well. He gave him everything he could handle in the wrestle. It was, I told him afterwards, they both kind of looked at me weird. Maybe it was a backhanded compliment, but I, I didn't mean it that way. I said, for a heavyweight match, that was amazing. <laughs> and then they're like, I, I was like, well, I, you know, what I mean is like the wrestling was just awesome. It's like, I think theirs was 11 9. I mean, you guys dropped 20 <laughs> points out there. It's like, that's a, that's all you want to see. Like, isn't that awesome? You know, for you guys, your size to be doing that. And, and it was the moves they were hitting. I mean, they were jumping all over the place and hitting cool stuff. And <laughs> you want to see that for everybody, right? You want, you want to, we, we talk about all the time of having a goal that transcends the win, having a goal that's bigger than just getting the dub. And that's part of that for some guys might be just being an entertainer. I want to put mm-hmm. on a show and make sure people are entertained when they come to see me. I thought everyone was entertained by the majority of our matches 
last Friday at the wrestle offs and especially those two guys. So that's another guy I would say. And I want to give one last shout out to another freshman, Anthony Rossi. Mm-hmm. I just love this kid. Um, man, love him. He, he, he lost his wrestle off, but every, everybody in our, in our program, everybody in our staff is just a huge fan of him. He doesn't say boo. All he does is work his tail off. He's the sweetest kid in the world. I mean, he's just, he's just awesome. So for what it's worth, that's another freshman. I mean, I love all our freshmen, but that's a guy too, that I want to make sure I give some props to. I like hearing the standouts among the recruiting class that, that just came in. Uh, it, it sparked an idea in my head, though, because a lot of times, especially these days where a lot of these freshmen are maybe they're all America or national title ready. Now, those are the blue chip guys that maybe only a few select schools can get. But I find it fascinating that the first two the first two guys that you pointed out are guys that are 197 and heavyweight, particularly Max Shulaw, who's at 197 right now. And you're like, wow, where'd that come from? When you look at freshmen that are able to acclimate that fast at a heavier weight like that, it's usually the lightweight guys are the ones yeah. that maybe have a better shot. Maybe it's a little bit more random. Are you a little bit more impressed knowing that a guy like Max, who's, again, 197, he's a big dude, he's already acclimated to guys that are – he's wrestling that are maybe like 21, 22 years old already at this point. Yeah, I think – and the reason why I think – people probably don't want to hear this, but it's God-given gifts. Mm-hmm. Um, the dude is jacked out of his mind. I mean, I'm talking God has blessed that young man with he, he looks like a statue in like the movies. I mean, it's like he's just he's so jacked and he's so strong. And I'll give him the credit, too, though. He does something with those God given gifts. He's a good steward of them. What I mean by that is he takes copious notes when he's when he's doing that individuals. He wants to have all the technique written out and all his action items and what he needs to work on. He's very organized. He goes he, he eats meal preps this is a freshman who has a meal plan that he meal preps because he wants to be the cleanest possible diet possible takes him a lot a lot of work to get down to 197 he was huge in the summer he's and not fat either he was like you know 215 220 jacked and so he does it the right way uh he he gets frustrated when he sees other kids at uva going out and doing things they shouldn't be doing in his mind well we in our mind because he doesn't want that for his life so he took these god-given talents and these gifts that i think you can't get them any other way. I mean, I, I look at me. I could take my shirt off right now and you throw up. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to shoe law. And then he did something when he was a good steward of those, and he's been cultivating those through focus, discipline, consistency, and living and doing everything the right way. I love hearing that. Now, I wanted to focus on you real quick because, again, you mentioned how much, how long you've been doing this. I believe this is your 19th season now at the university, uh, being the head coach. So you're going on almost two decades, which, you know, time flies and also it feels like a long time, but you've seen pretty much it all at Virginia from how the sport has grown on the mat, off the mat. What have you noticed from maybe when you first stepped on campus to even this year where you just said, you know, you did some things over the summer that you've never done before. What has that change been like for you as a head coach going from when you when you first walk in as head coach to now where you've seen pretty much everything, but yet you're still adjusting on the fly a little bit. Man, that's such a good question. I, you know, when I got here in 2006, I'd, I'd been at Cornell for six years and it was just such a great environment to train in and to learn in. Um, this is how old I am. Kyle Dake was in like seventh grade, like our, <laughs> our like our little youth club at the time. Like that's how old that's how it's crazy how fast it goes. And yeah, and and so when I got here though, I was the youngest head coach in the country. I had a lot to learn. I was a young man that thought he knew everything but didn't know crap. And I got humbled. And it was in that pity humility in 2006, 2007 that everything changed in my life. And shocker, as it changed in my life personally, it changed professionally. And so within four seasons, we went from dead last at nationals to 15th at nationals in just four years huge turnaround. And what, what we were doing back then, it was me and Scotty Moore primarily. And then Alex Clemson came in and Jordan Lee and Gavin, Keith Gavin, we had a bunch of guys in the Paulsons. Now I've had great assistance, but really it started with me and him just getting on the road and trying to get the best possible recruits. And it's funny because back then we had nothing to sell. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was, people looked at us like we were crazy and, and a little bit of it was blind faith and believing in us as coaches. And now the expectations completely change because now once you finish top 15 in 2010, then we got to do better. Right. And so mm-hmm. for the next five years, we won two ACC championships. And, you know, I, I was talking, telling Rock a story, Rock Harrison a story yesterday. I remember that 2012 team, I think it was where we wrestled Iowa. We had four all Americans and seven round of, or six round of 12 guys total in one dual meet team. And so we built, started building it. And we started, when we started knocking off, we knocked off Michigan, Lehigh, Arizona state, um, gosh, I remember when Boise State was top 12, we beat them. We beat Pitt when they were top 10. We beat Virginia Tech when they were ranked seventh. I mean, we started racking up these wins. and, and But then here's the thing, though. Then it just keeps getting crazier. And then all the other teams, you know, er- everybody's getting better, though. Like, you know, everybody, everybody's hustling. All the coaches are trying to do their best. Everyone's out grinding. Everyone's out the the Super 32. And 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 I, I think that the, the game just kept elevating and elevating and elevating. And then universities started to support their teams. Uh, back, back when I first started this thing, 
people don't ever ever realize this, but at Cornell, we had one of the worst wrestling rooms, if not the worst in the country when I first mm-hmm. started there in the spring of 2000. You know, so now athletic departments are actually pouring into their teams. Like Virginia mm-hmm. Tech has way different facilities than when I first started in 2006. You know, uh, Pitt's getting a whole new room. We, we've got a whole new complex. We just put $1.2 million into our renovated locker room and renovated wrestling room. So we're, we're all doing everything we can. So there's been so many positives in that way. The negatives uh, are the landscape of NCAA athletics is completely upside down from where it was. When I first started this in business 24 years ago, it was a completely different world than it is now. And, and gosh, I miss it in a lot of ways. <laughs> there, was a goal. there was actually, you know, there was, there was some, some guidelines, you know, it's just, it's just out of control. It's crazy. What's, what's going on right now. And so, yeah, so me, one of my hardest things, and I think a lot of people hate change. I don't like change. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive. I'm probably tension deficit hyperactivity to the max. I'm like a rat on acid. So, you know, <laughs> for me to change, it's like, I, I really have to lock in and say, all right, I have to evolve here. We have to like even something similar is changing this summer. It's like we I, we yeah. have to do things different, or else we're going to keep getting the same results. So, I'm not there yet completely, but I'm I need to I need to keep evolving with the times, whether that be nil, whether that be the settlement, whatever's going on in the in yeah. the school. I need to keep evolving. I like that perspective, and it's interesting because when you were a wrestler at Virginia, you know, highly successful college career, you may I, I you alluded to something what, describing your coaching career, how you know. Basically, teams tried to catch up to you at one point, and then all of a sudden, everyone's in that so uh, that that uh, so to speak rat race, or yeah. it's, it's an arms race with facilities, with the conference, with the entire college wrestling uh, landscape. I find it fascinating how, when you were at Virginia, did you feel like you had to prove that Virginia was a def was a desired location to come and wrestle to win, uh, you know, dual meets to win conference titles to win national championships. And do you kind of have to reprove yourself or reprove that to other people as a head coach pretty much each year, despite the success yes. that you've had in the past? Dude, you nailed it. You freaking, that's one of the most frustrating things. I can't believe I still have to go into kids' houses and prove yeah. myself, but I do. I still, I can't believe that I still have to bring kids on grounds and, and explain to them that I actually know what I'm doing and that our staff is amazing. And that this place is like, yeah, I, I know that's the job. People are probably like, yeah, do your job, Steve. I'm like, no, I know, I know. But, you know, it's like it started with, like, I remember Chris Henrick was the first one to jump on board, he, and he ended up being a three-time All-American, two-time ACC champ. And then that helped us get Nick Solzer, was the next big guy. Nick mm-hmm. was a three-time All-American. And Nick helps us get George D. Camillo, who's an NSA finalist. George D. Camillo helps us get Jack Mueller, who's an NSA finalist. You see how it worked? And, but I think – I'm just being, maybe I'm being too honest. I, I always thought that, okay, at some point though, it's going to get easier. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, I'm pushing 50 now. It's like, I'm I, by then I'll have it figured out. And by then it's like, people will know, you know, that you can do it here. People will know that guys have been great. It, no, they don't know. I mean, if I mentioned any of those names to any recruit in the 26 class, when I called them on day one, almost not the only guy they'd probably ever heard of is Jack Mueller because I saw Jack on TV when he beat the one seed at nationals, you know, <laughs> uh, that's probably the only thing that, but everybody else would be like, Chris, who? Nick who, you know, so Steve who, so, so yeah, that is a, it's a constant thing every year, year in and year out, you have to reinvent yourself and remarket yourself and all that stuff. And it gets tough because mm-hmm. look, I don't care who you are. I, I hope at least you don't want to brag. You don't want to brag. It's hard to talk about yourself. Who the heck wants to do that? Right. It's really uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable. I should say, mm-hmm. you know, I guess maybe there's some guys who don't mind doing it, but it shouldn't be something that comes easy to you. Yeah. And, but that's what we have to do. I mean, I don't have it. How many people told me in the last five years, Steve, you have to do a better job of shamelessly plugging yourself. And I'm like, <laughs> really? You know, like, I feel like my mom told me something different when I was growing up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all about being humble. And I, and I, it's funny you bring up George D. Camus. I remember that run. I believe that was 2017 in St. Louis getting to the NCAA finals. It was one of the, I guess one of the stories of the tournament. So when you talk about having, you know, having coached all Americans and AC champions, and you just mentioned how him and Jack Mueller were NCAA finalists. So naturally the next step is who's going to be that guy to take the next step and become that first national champion. Do you think about that, you know, pretty much every day is it, or is it something that you don't want to think about because it, it puts maybe undue pressure on yourself, your staff, and even the kids that you recruit. Again, probably too honest. I probably think about it too much. Like yeah. I, we want it bad. Yeah. You know? Uh, when when George lost in the finals, I mean we were uh, nothing against his opponent. His opponent was great. I just really believed he was going to win. Yeah. Uh, and so when you really believe something with all your heart and you don't get it, it's devastating and it hurts. Mm-hmm. I remember like stumbling around the afterwards, and I just given a speech at the Fellowship of Christian Athletes prayer breakfast that morning, and then and the the conclusion was you've already won, so go win. And so Georgie being a Christian, his parents, he's, he's got everything he needs in life. Mm-hmm. So even if he loses, he's already won. He can't lose. And, 
And uh, Turbel Delagdev reminded me of my speech in the hallway and it helped me out a little bit because I was starting to go this way. <laughs> and it just broke my heart. Like we're going to have, I was convinced we're going to have our first national champ. And then same thing with Mueller, even though Mueller had Spencer Lee, I'm, yeah. I'm like bizarrely um, favoring, uh, like I have bizarre confidence when it comes to Jack Mueller. Like I feel like he can do anything. Like he's mm -hmm. just a dude. I love him. So I really thought he was going to beat Spencer, even though he didn't, I thought he was going to. Mm -hmm. And, and so when you lose, you're just like, you're heartbroken, you know? And so, yeah, I think we, we want that bad. What we can't do though, and this is just coaching one-on-one, we can't get fixated on the outcome. We have to stay focused on the process. I think mm -hmm. I started to lose my joy a little bit. COVID didn't help. There was a two, three year stretch where I was, it was tough for me mm -hmm. because I was so bent on, we got to get this. We got to get we, ready for this. The, the worst words a coach can ever say, we need this. You know, don't ever say you need anything. You yeah. may want it, but you don't need it. You need error. Yeah. <laughs> my wife at home. I don't, I don't need to have a national chip, but it's like, you still want it. And you have yeah. these goals and you want it for the kids. You want it for your program, but cause no one loves this place more than me. I went here, man, you know, and, and, and I, I lost in the finals. So I almost want it for them maybe even more because of what happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of weird. Maybe I can't believe that just came out of my mouth, but it's like, I want, I want them to win so bad because I, you know, that, that type of thing. So, so yeah, man, it, it's, it's something that definitely, it, it also can be a thing that propels you and moves you forward and helps right. you up every day. But for me, I actually had to refocus and say, okay, let's get back to the basics. I used to give a speech entitled, if the why is not right, nothing's right. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to my why and let's stick to that. And then God will honor that and something good will happen or it won't. But yeah, I really appreciate that considering, you know, as you mentioned, that goal could always keep you going. But sometimes, as you just mentioned, getting back to basics might be the best thing to move forward. And it seems like you guys are moving forward with a exciting young roster. You got some veterans coming back as well. Uh, the schedule looks really good. And I'm, I'm actually very interested in this because I'm a big dual meet guy. I love uh, elevating the sport that way. You guys are doing Throwdown the Yorktown on November 8th, which is going to be really cool. Gardner Webb and Citadel are on the schedule or on the docket for you guys. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that event, how it came together, and how really unique it is for an early season event for uh, college wrestling. So – I'm telling you right now, we got so lucky with that one. I wish I could say something clever or that, you know, we had something figured out, but um, basically a congressman by the name of Neil Collins, who's just an amazing guy. He called me up. He's, he had, we have friend of a friend, right? A good friend of mine who, who's a, 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 I won't say his name to embarrass him, but he's, he's a very reputable official in the NCAA and they were friends. And then he recommended me, Neil calls me up and says, Hey man, we're going to do this amazing event. It's one of a kind type thing. We want Virginia to be a part of it. Immediately, I was like, all right. I, had, I was thinking about doing something else. I think I was doing something with maybe Frank. I was thinking about doing something with Papa Lijo because he's my boy up, up in New York. But I'm like, I can't pass this up. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. And we have a donor uh, slash good friend of ours who is a former rear admiral of the United States Navy, top gun pilot. Um, I just felt like guys like that, what they're doing, how can we not honor him by doing that? We have to do this to honor guys like him to do, to give our kids this experience, to be able to engulf ourselves in something that's one of a kind type event. We, we had to do it. So it was an easy decision. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a very unique venue as well. Uh, one more on the ACC in general, because it kind of relates to the schedule, because I think you guys are you actually you guys are going out there. You're going out to Palo Alto. Stanford's on the schedule this year, new ACC member for this year. Uh, as far as wrestling is concerned, of course, we've seen it already with the other sports already. Football, we've already seen it, them going, you know, which is still weird, you know, considering they're a West Coast team and they're yeah. in the Atlantic Coastal Conference. Uh, what do you make of Stanford being in the conference from a wrestling perspective? I, I talked to Chris Ayers uh, the other week. <clears throat> Him being a Jersey guy, he had a big change going out to Stanford, but he loves the ACC already. What do you make of Stanford being in the conference now? Well, well, you know, the good side of it is, I mean, they're an amazing team. And Chris is an amazing coach. He does a really, really good job. He always has. And so our conference was already crazy tough. Now it just mm. got even tougher. Uh, so, I mean, look, our conference, you can take the Pepsi Challenge with, with us or with anybody, right? I mean, it's just really tough. I yeah. mean, every single weight, every guy. So, so yeah, it's like, whoo, got to throw another one. And, oh, by the way, how about this for a grind? And I'm just looking at my schedule now. NC State. Stanford, and then four days later, Virginia Tech. Oh, by the way, flying <laughs> back from California. Other than that, pretty easy January. <laughs> Holy crap, dude. Like, I just, I just looked at that. It was like, yeah. So I'm not – the bad side is I'm not happy about traveling out to California, especially first. Like, frankly – and, and right. Chris, I gave him a hard time. We gave – I was joking, but not joking. Like, 
no, heck, heck with that. I, I don't want our team to have to fly all the way out there first. You guys come to us. We're helping you out. <laughs> like the conference just bails you guys out. But that didn't go anywhere, of course. No one listened to me. But I, I, <laughs> I don't want to do that to our kids, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think it makes it, we're just going to have to get even tougher because it's, it's that crazy now. Do you find it amazing that the grind of the ACC is very unique? I mean, everyone looks at the big 10 and how loaded that conference is every year. The big 12 has a lot of teams, of, of course, but the ACC from a wrestling perspective, of course, is not as big as say what it looks like in football or basketball. A lot of schools don't have programs or used to have programs and don't, and don't anymore. So I believe it's what, six or seven teams in the ACC. And, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, it's, it's still a meat grinder of a schedule despite the fact that it's not, you know, 14 programs. Right. Sure. I mean, think about it. there's, I mean, you know, I think the one year this before Stanford, every single team, five of the six were nationally ranked. And now with Stanford, you'll potentially have six of the seven. I mean, uh, that's pretty, pretty dang steep, you know? And, and I think it's the concentrated level, right? So I'm looking at the schedule now. So January 17th to, 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 uh, February 21st, this, this little window pit UNC, Duke, Virginia Tech, Stanford, NC State, right? It's just – so, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not as elongated as the Big Ten, but I think any recruit in the country would say, wow, that's going to be a really tough schedule. Because they ask that, what's your schedule like? It's like, it's really good. Um, and it's not like – I think the high school – this is a weird tangent maybe, but the high school models, you cut your weight, you, you go crazy, you train, you train your heart out for the Super 32, and then you're off for a month. You go crazy, you train for Fargo, then you're off for two months. Mm. That's not the, that's that's a terrible model for to to in sort of to transfer to college because college it's every week, baby. You got to be ready to rock every single week. I think the biggest transition for first years for freshmen mm. is when they come in they're 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 not used to that because what they do is they just train for one big event and even like at in the high school state uh, level, you know they'll have a couple of tough duels, maybe a couple of tough Christmas tournaments, and then they kind of go like this, and then yeah. all of a sudden February picks back up, right? It's like that's not the way it is in college. Every weekend you got to be ready. And I think that's that's where you find out the difference between the guys that are here mentally and in here really tough uh, and the guys that are talented. There's two different things. I think really what it comes down to is being able to grind like that because it's it's just there's nothing like that grind when you feel it the first time. Do you like pitching that in recruiting with, uh, you know, whether the guys that you've done with in the past or these future recruits? I mean, do you like pitching that saying, you know, you can go to these other schools and like, yeah, it's going to be a grind, but you can come here too or even stay local and say, yeah, it's still – just as just as much of a grind and also we want to help you with that adjustment from yeah you're going to go hard for spurts in high school then you have your longer part of the season but for if you come to virginia we want you to be ready pretty much 365 at this point yeah we try to so I, honestly we try to communicate that and again it's probably too too much information but then you look at them in, in january and they're like this I mean, it's just the face they make. I mean, they, you can just feel it on them. You can yeah. see it when they walk in the room. They just, there's a, they, it, no matter how much you try to warn somebody, like here's an example to bust on myself. If somebody would said, Steve, you have no idea how hard that first year as head coach is going to be. You have no idea. You have no idea how, how hard your first child is going to be, Steve. That's now a freshman here at UVA. You have no idea. You have no hard, idea how hard marriage is going to be. People did say that to me. You know what I said as a young, dumb guy? Because you can't tell a young guy anything. I'm like, okay, I got it. <laughs> got it. Yep. Check. You know, it's like, I got it all. I got it all. Every wrestler knows how to figure it out. Right. And then sure enough, every one of those things I just said, I wasn't ready. And, I, and there's no, 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 nobody could have told me you had to experience it. And then mm -hmm. that's why the second child was easier. And then the second year was easier. And then you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I think, I think they almost have to, no matter how much you tell them, we try to, I think they need to feel it and live it. Yeah, not that the job for you is easy. I mean, maybe you say it's it's gotten easier for you. And I'm I'm curious to know, again, almost two decades in at this point, and having been at other places as an assistant coach, and again being an alum of the school, is any part of the job easier for you at this point? I know we've already alluded to the changes in the college landscape with NIL. Obviously, the transfer portal is a big thing. It, but but is any part of this job easier, whether you're rolling with the guys or just talking with the guys or maybe re relying on your assistant coaches a little bit more? Is any part of this job a little bit easier for you now? And you're asking some good ones because I'm trying to be honest too, right? And I, honestly, some things have gotten harder. I think the things have gotten easier. I think I, I'm, I'm better at um, empowering the assistant yeah. coaches and not being such an, a, a, 
when I first got here, I was probably really not probably, I was really hard to work with. Cause I was like, I got, you know, and, and, and I was doing a lot of things well, but I was also probably doing a lot of things wrong too. So I think I'm doing a better job that I shouldn't say easier, but I think I'm doing a better job of empowering our staff and giving them autonomy. And, 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 you know, you got this brother and you got this and okay, hopefully communicating hard truths is something I was, I'm trying to get better at every day. I've been using this expression a lot that hard truth is the currency of a positive culture mm. in our sport. Um, and so I, doing that what's gotten harder though is the re the wrestling admittedly i'm i'm 47 years old i don't wrestle like i used to but what's gotten easier is me being okay with that like in other words like my job is to make this guy better not to be the big tough guy in the wrestling room yeah. and i used to get off like every, every no coach will admit this but they get off on beating everybody's butt in the room and i used to <laughs> love going in there and, and beating heine and looking over at cole like you know, like, like I, I can't do it anymore. And so God humbled me in that way. And so now it's shocker about the kids and about who, how do I get these guys better today? Um, and so, so hopefully I've gotten a little better at that too. I like that. You know, I, I can only imagine being, especially fresh off your college career. And whenever you started coaching, you're just like, oh yeah, I, mean, I gotta show the young bucks the ropes a little bit. So yeah. it, it is fascinating that you've kind of reeled yourself back a little bit when it comes to that. Do, do you still let your assistants fly around and maybe like in uh, layman's terms, let them be the Matt boys in the wrestling room. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So Trent, Trent's crazy. Trent Paulson actually ne has never missed a practice when he's healthy. Like he, other than he had knee surgery, other than that, he's never literally never not done live with the guys. And I've never seen him lose. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's that tough. And then Ian Parker is just, he's training, he's trying to make world teams and national mm -hmm. teams himself. So he trains every day. So he wrestled there. And then Travis, they mostly focused on technique, but he straps up every day and wrestles every day, but more, more spar uh, technique. Mm -hmm. And he's really good individually. So those guys, like, matter of fact, it's funny you say that most people that come watch our practice and visit mm -hmm. are like, wow, your whole staff's in there, like going with the guys. We didn't expect that. And I, I don't go as much as I used to, but I'm still in there, you know, twice a week I'm doing stuff. I'm, I'm in there every day in practice, but I don't yeah. get to go live like I used to. But so it's mostly primarily them now. Yes. I love hearing that. Uh, Coach, I'll leave you here with this one again. Really appreciate your time. A lot of good stuff today. Uh, I find it fascinating that you're going, you went from very resistant to change. And now you're evolving with the times, evolving with the sport. As far as the growth is, or as far as the growth of the sport is concerned. Now, I do ask everybody this because, again, I'm being from Jersey and seeing the postseason format, I'm a big dual meet guy and a big team aspect guy as far as maybe how this sport continues to grow at the Division One levels. We've seen it with women's basketball and more uh, more in particular probably women's volleyball as well from a olympic sports standpoint do you think a dual meet championship is one feasible and two maybe required for the sport to keep uh, being elevated on a grander stage to either ensure its survival or just to keep it growing and be on par with some of the other olympic sports and perhaps basketball one day well i answered this way i absolutely support a dual meet championship mm -hmm. for sure like i'm on I'm maybe not as passionate or vocal as Coach Goodell, but I'm definitely on his train. I think. Yeah. Look, and I I was on the NCAA committee way back. I think I got on in 2008, maybe 2007. So I was like a while ago. But and I remember talking about it then. I remember going out to Chicago one year. I don't even remember what year that was. And and we all got all the head coaches went out to the Big Ten office and tried to get it done. I've been on it since then. I've always been a proponent. Of this. I'm with you, man. I think the dual meets are absolutely critical. Uh, for our sport and they're so they're so much fun it's such a different experience in the tournament um now you mentioned is it feasible uh, sadly i don't think it's going to happen because it, it takes what it takes and um and maybe i'm being too pessimistic but i've again been doing this a long time and i've seen almost every time it gets to where we're going to start to make momentum something shifts mm. or something like here I, i've been on a subcommittee that's been trying to get a one our wrestling change to a one semester sport forever yeah forever and we just keep getting shot down year after year and it breaks my heart because i'm like what am i doing all this work for why am i doing these conference calls why am i doing these zooms why am i doing these emails why am i doing all this all this talking and all this thinking and all this analytics when we just get shot down so it, it gets discouraging sometimes so like i just because I, I can't understand why that's not just a no-brainer we yeah. why are we why are we going from august to march that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. you know let there's got to be a way to change that it's funny you say that because in, in now now this will be my last question, but, but, but you sparked the idea. I've heard the one semester suggestion before by numerous coaches, and even if there's no team aspect or a dual meet championship added on to that, do you think it'd be a lot better even with the sport? If you didn't change the sport at all, but you just changed the time frame of it, if you went from, let's say, January to April, mid-April, or even yeah. if it's just – even if preseason is what? After Thanksgiving or right before Christmas, that's where you start it, and then you go through – 
April, at some point in April. Do you think, even as the sport is, cu is currently constructed, that is better for a long-term growth and maybe the long-term health of the sport? Yes. Simplest answer I can give you on this whole, yeah. all, all your questions. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. I can, only, I can only imagine if that change is made, maybe we'll actually see a, an uptick in either participation or eyeballs or whatever the case may be. Hopefully the sport is healthier with either a one semester sport or, you know, maybe one day a dual meet championship. We'll, we'll get there one day. Steve Garland, Virginia head coach with me on On3 Wrestling. Coach, really appreciate your time. Looking forward to watching you guys this year. Hopefully we'll catch up again in uh, Philadelphia when it comes to the NCAA championships in March. Yeah, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Take care. I appreciate, I appreciate it. On3 Wrestling right here. Be sure to like and subscribe to this video. Check out our content at on3.com as well. We'll see you next time.